For as long as I can remember, I have loved going to the movies. There is something so captivating and transformative about film. How a gifted screenwriter can turn incredible ideas into powerful words, summoning drama, humor, and conflict from the page like casting a spell. How an actor who knows their part better than they know themselves can breathe life into those words, creating a character who until that moment only existed on paper, and a performance with the potential to be remembered for generations to come. And how a director with vision and imagination can bind those rare elemental creative forces, fashioning them into a gateway able to draw you into whole other worlds, holding fast to your senses until the closing credits roll, and sometimes, if the job is well done, for far longer. My name is M. Glenn Gore. I'll be your host each week as we explore in depth the newest releases both in the theater and at home. You're watching In Like Glenn, and today we're discussing Game Night. The following video review contains spoilers for the film Game Night. Proceed with caution. I have a love-hate relationship with movie trailers, and while I sympathize with the hard-working cats challenged with a none-too-small chore of cutting together enough riveting footage to entice me into the theater without giving away the store, you guys are starting to fray my last good nerve. It's one thing to divulge a minor plot point here and there, but if your movie is built entirely on a single big reveal, maybe don't tell me what it is half a year before it comes out. Do you remember the trailer for Castaway, the fantastic turn of the millennium Robert Zemeckis survival drama that stranded Oscar magnate Tom Hanks on a deserted island with only a volleyball and his rapidly departing sanity? That trailer in no uncertain terms shows and tells you he makes it home safely. We had a funeral, a coffin, what was in it? What about the preview for the 2009 reboot and subsequent near-franchise death knell Terminator Salvation, in which they carelessly disclose that Sam Worthington's Marcus Wright is actually a machine? Or the trailer for 2005's The Island, Michael Bay's final attempt at an intelligent film, which literally contains the lines There is no island! And my personal favorite You're copies of people. Do one of them get sick and they need a new part, they take it from you! Yeah! Game Night is a dark comic adventure from directors John Francis Daly and Jonathan M. Goldstein, the scribes behind 2011's Horrible Bosses, who would go on to serve as two of the 47 screenwriters on Spider-Man Homecoming. Written by Mark Perez, the writer behind... Oh. Oh, boy. You know what? Let's just move on. <clears throat> the trailer for Game Night presents you with a solidly amusing premise. Max and Annie hold a weekly couple's game night with their friends, and everything is crescent fresh until Max's more successful older brother Brooks breezes into town for a visit and takes their commonly benign board game shenanigans up several notches by arranging a murder mystery party. The rules are simple. At some point during the night, one member of the seven-player game will be abducted, and it's up to the remaining six to follow clues to their location to rescue them. The evening begins, and as foretold, mask-adorned hooligans crash the party, whisking Brooks away to points unknown. The proverbial beans the trailer spills are that the innocent game everyone believes they're playing is very real, and the stakes couldn't be higher. They just don't know it. Max's brother Brooks isn't a banker, but a smuggler, and his dirty deeds done dirt cheap have stoked the ire of a dangerous mob boss who is gunning for a scalp. And I want my scalps! With none of them the wiser, each couple splits up, racing each other to solve the mystery, and raucous foul mouth hijinks expectedly ensue. As it turns out, Game Night is pretty funny. It's shot with style, using a couple of editing tactics from Edgar Wright's playbook, a handful of comic devices Taika Waititi wouldn't appreciate, and basically operates as a love letter to David Fincher, with a number of slick camera maneuvers that are straight out of Zodiac, and of course, The Game, the one movie you'll find most difficult not to liken this to. There are others to be certain. Game Night draws its inspiration from mischief-filled entries far and wide, like the 1980 late-night team-color-coded scavenger hunt Midnight Madness, Jonathan Lynn's board game-based 1985 romp Clue, and the 1997 not-quite-funny-enough-to-be-a-comedy Bill Murray spy farce The Man Who Knew Too Little. And while it is reminiscent of all of the above, I can't help but wonder if Game Night would have been a better picture if the audience weren't in on the gag. How much more fun could this have been if we weren't already hip to the knowledge that the game in question is anything but? Being armed with that information going into the movie doesn't keep you from enjoying it, not by a long shot, but you do have to marvel at this missed opportunity to capitalize on one of its greatest revelations. Jason Bateman of Arrested Development and Juno plays Max, one half of a hyper-competitive suburban married couple obsessed with winning at all costs. He is the same Bateman we've come to know and love, which is to say he isn't playing anyone here we haven't seen before. That's not really what I was going for. Rachel McAdams of Midnight in Paris and Doctor Strange co-stars as Annie, Max's wife, and proves with a one-two punch of impressive timing and quirky delivery that her knack for comedy hasn't abandoned her. The competitive couple have been trying to get pregnant with no success, a target that starts to drift further and further away when we learn Max may not be ready to hang up his spurs. It's cliché, yes, and of course, we've all seen this before. 
Luckily, McAdams and Bateman have solid chemistry, which goes a long way to elevating the less than original narrative unfolding around them. I would say Annie is the character you're likely to remember most once the lights come up, but that title goes to someone else, whom I'll get to in short order. Lamorne Morris of the frankly outstanding Barbershop The Next Cut and Fox's offbeat primetime smash New Girl plays Kevin, and unfortunately isn't remarkable enough in the movie to really note. I've seen evidence of his ability to be funny before, but minus a well-timed pratfall or two, it's barely on display here. His counterpart is Michelle, played by Kylie Bunbury of the short-lived Stephen King novel-based CBS series Under the Dome, who is also underutilized. Their gimmick is that they're high school sweethearts and soulmates, married before they were out of their teens and hopelessly in love. That is, until Kevin learns Michelle once slept with a celebrity when they were dating and never told him. The movie returns to this bit ad nauseum, but when it's all said and done, the laughs it elicits come at Michelle's expense, merely making her look dumb. Make no mistake, she's hardly alone here. Despite being depicted as masters of low-stakes, weeknight, grill-and-pub caliber trivia, all but one of the characters in the group suffers from absurd fits of idiocy, something that grows harder and harder to ignore as the events play out. Game Night possesses no greater example of this than Ryan, the gang's impossibly dim-witted friend played by Ingrid Goes West, Billy Magnuson. And when I say dim-witted, I mean that. He is painfully incompetent. Like, to the degree you wonder how he hasn't somehow managed to trip and fall into a wheat thresher yet incompetent. Ryan is an example of a particular type of character I see a lot, but no one, be they fans or filmmakers, can ever convincingly explain why they're around. South Park's psychotic, overweight bigot Eric Cartman. Saved by the Bell's nails against a chalkboard level grating screech. Big Bang Theory's insufferable Sheldon Cooper. I never understand why anyone in the story would hang around these people, let alone befriend them. Obviously a comedy, especially one with a setup as far-fetched as this one's, requires a measure of suspension of disbelief. But everyone else is shown to mostly have their respective acts together, so the idea that they would choose to spend time with someone like this is hard for even me to swallow. Everyone in Game Night is kind of a caricature, with the exception of Catastrophe's Sharon Horgan. She plays Sarah, an uncommonly intelligent and sensible young woman who attends the get-together on the arm of walking lobotomy Ryan, who is infamously known within the group for bringing a different beautiful but vapid date each week. Sarah feels like an actual person. Oh, that's sweet. Her attitude towards the mayhem they're embroiled in is believable. Her reactions are realistic, and even she seems to look at the other characters as though they're probably all recent escapees from a mental ward. Kyle Chandler of the superb Wolf of Wall Street and the even more superb Argo is perfectly cast as the self-aggrandizing and tantalizingly punchable Brooks, who sports a black belt and dickishness here. I wager anyone with a brother of their own will find his performance aggravatingly convincing. He and Max are engaged in a never-ending sibling rivalry that feels all too real, even when it is dialed up to a thousand. The one character in Game Night who really demands to be remembered once the credits roll, however, is Breaking Bad's Jesse Plemons, who is pioneering into whole new arenas of awkward and unsettling with his portrayal of Gary, a recently divorced police officer and next-door neighbor to Max and Annie, whom they have been understandably avoiding with all their combined effort. In the bizarrely well-populated category of people who look just a little too much like Matt Damon, Plemons comes in at a respectable second place. He is so genuinely unnerving in this, you find yourself actively trying to avoid his gaze because, after a while, it starts to feel like he might be able to see you through the screen. Plemons is responsible for so many of the movie's laugh-out-loud moments, few of which require him to do much more than just stand there and exist. Game Night manages to pull off a handful of very effective action sequences, including a simulated one-take manor house set room-to-room -room foot chase over ownership of a Fabergé egg that is fairly entertaining. Its aggressive soundtrack by Neon Demon's Cliff Martinez also does a great deal of heavy lifting and adding much-needed tension and excitement to the exploit. In addition, the movie excels admirably in the setup and payoff department, something I'm well known for harping on. Nothing is wasted, with even the most throwaway of lines coming back in amusing if not slightly predictable fashion. While the film is oftentimes quite funny, it's never as over-the-top or outlandish as I feel like it wants to be. A premise such as this screams for ambition, which sadly isn't there, even despite it's the Fast and the Furious-esque finale, also callously spoiled by the aforementioned trailer. To wit, I would argue that too much of the movie's humor relies on pop culture references. These characters are fans like all of us, and for that we can probably excuse them, but the persistent nods to material that is already dated does the movie no favors. It's also too apparent that the filmmakers don't trust the audience to actually get the references made, as there is always a character present to explain to you what the reference is. It's as if Seth MacFarlane had a hand in script doctoring it. Jesus, I look like the robot from Aliens. 
You don't find much chemistry between the players beyond Bateman and McAdams, which is a shame. The movie presents these characters to us as people who've known one another for years, yet they never really come off as much more than passing acquaintances. The things they learn about one another over the chaotic evening they share are rarely more than surface deep. All told, Game Night doesn't reinvent the wheel or the comedy, but it is fast, frenetic, and chock full of enough twists, turns, and genuine laughs to more than make up for that fact. In the end, making this one game I wouldn't be against playing again. There are much worse games to play. I'm giving Game Night 3 out of 5 stars. That's it for today's episode. As always, thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed the show, please like, share, and subscribe. And follow me on Twitter for more updates. Until next time, you were just in like Glenn.